Okay, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redmond, and you can find this podcast and every other podcast I do by going to PorkinsPolicyReview.com. Well, uh, today um, we have a, a very special guest, and that is Robbie Martin. And uh, for anyone that doesn't know, and I'm assuming that pretty much everyone does know who Robbie is, uh, Robbie is the founder of MediaRoots.org and the co-host of Media Roots Radio, of course, with his sister, Abby Martin. Uh, Robbie's also a musician, and uh, we'll have a link up to his uh, music, and you can find that all on Bandcamp. Uh, but Robbie is uh, also uh, a director, and he has uh, just put out a, a new film, uh, the first of a three-part film called A Very Heavy Agenda. And that's, uh, that's uh, uh, why Robbie is joining us today to talk about the film. But uh, before we get uh, into that, uh, Robbie, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I know this has been a long time coming. We had a couple little uh, technical you know, issues before, but I'm really glad that you're joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Pierce. Um, I've been a fan for a while, and uh, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, thanks for the very flattering intro, by the way. Um, <laughs> I I don't know if you said I was the f- co-founder of Media Roots, but just in case you did, I I was not. I'm just a contributor. So oh, I've been okay. contributing since its its beginning, but Abby it's pretty much her baby from from the start. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah, I did say co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's okay. <laughs> um, all right. Awesome. Well, uh, anyway, as I said, um, we're, we're going to be speaking uh, to Robbie about his new film, A Very Heavy Agenda. And this is going to be part one, which is called A Catalyzing Event. Uh, and this is a really interesting film. And uh, I'm a, I mean, I'm excited for parts two and three as well. But uh, Robbie, why don't you give uh, people sort of a breakdown uh, you know, just sort of a brief summary of the film, because I think, um, you know, some people might uh, look at it sort of at face value and think, oh, this is this is just like another 9-11 truth film or something like that. Uh, and certainly 9-11 is a, is a big uh, focus in the first film, but this is uh, in the first part, rather. But um, this is really a, a much, much different film and a lot deeper in a lot of ways. Um, so why don't you kind of give us uh, a little bit of a rundown on what the film is? Do you want me to, like, describe the the whole total of it or just part one? Well, I mean, why don't we get into part one and then we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about part two and three later, but explain what, you know, part one is about. Okay. Yeah. So, so the part one is, is called a catalyzing event and I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with where that phrase comes from, which is the rebuilding, um, America's defenses document, uh, from the think tank, the project for the new American century. Uh, which, of course, uh, is where that infamous phrase comes from, um, that uh, absent something like a catastrophic or catalyzing event, um, like a new Pearl Harbor, (laughs) uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to basically build up our military as fast um, as they were proposing to in this Rebuilding America's Defenses document. They wanted to transform our forces to be more aggressive and postured more aggressively than even... uh, during the Cold War, um, because a lot of these neoconservatives who who started this project for the new American century and the, and sort of the neoconservatives who sort of circled around it and were echoing the same things that they were saying. And this project was started in 1997 um, during the Clinton administration. And uh, they claim that they started the project to... Uh, to basically cheer on Clinton yeah. <laughs> um, whenever he was doing things that they liked. So, so they, so from their perspective, they they claim that when um, Clinton wanted to go into Bosnia and Kosovo, the Republican sort of mindset at the time was more um, Pat, uh, what's his name, Pat Buchanan, kind mm-hmm. of more a little bit more isolationist. Um, you know, than the normal Republican mindset, but not like Ron Paul isolation. It's more like, you know, a little bit, like a hints of that. So they claim that that was very pervasive in the 90s and that they wanted to basically push and promote Clinton's military interventions when Republicans didn't want to uh, go into Bosnia and Kosovo. <laughs> so when you watch Fox News um, from, you know, before t- the year 2000, you can see clips of like Sean Hannity and other Fox News reporters talking about, um, how Clinton's going to ki- bomb a bunch of innocent civilians in Kosovo yeah, yeah. and how horrible it would be and stuff. So 
they were, you know, they were basically trying to go after Clinton for anything. But the neocons are smart enough to know because they are heavily funded and invested in, um, you know, defense contractor companies um, that you have to cheer on every military intervention. I mean, that's the way to sell weapons and that's the way to, you know, um, to keep this machinery going. So uh, disagreeing with a president's, um, you know, military intervention simply out of partisan reasons is, you know, to them was illogical um, because as they saw it, that was a continuation of the the Reagan doctrine um, to, you know, do these quote unquote humanitarian uh, bombing campaigns and things like that. So this group of neoconservatives, um, I'd say the core members of this group um, were Paul Wolfowitz, who was sort of the formative figure um, behind a lot of the ideas and projects for the New American Century. But he wasn't actually, the, the, he didn't actually found the organization. It was, um, it was two guys who were more unknown in government. Uh, they, were, they were in government, but they, weren't, they didn't really hold high positions. Um, one of them was Bill Kristol who was Dan Quayle's chief of staff uh, during the George H.W. Bush administration. Or, so it wasn't really, you know, it's not really something to be proud of to be the <laughs> chief of staff for someone, you know, so widely um, made fun of. But that's where he comes from. Um, the other founder of uh, Project for the New American Century, uh, his name is Robert Kagan. And he's sort of who the movie focuses on the most because... His role in the government originally was um, a more diplomatic uh, State Department role. And he claims that he worked in the U.S. Information Agency during the Reagan um, presidency, and which was basically, as he describes, um, the way, the, what the U.S. propaganda machine was at that time. Um, I guess they called it the U.S. Information Agency. Um, and you can find a little bit of stuff that he did when he was working for that agency um there's a memo that leaked where he's basically uh coming up with ways to intimidate jewish journalists into going siding with israel um so just like to try to paint basically um israeli or sorry to paint jewish journalists who write critically about israel as self-hating jews that's sort of like hit right. what the memo basically says like how can we make this happen like divide you know divide these camps so that anybody who's critical of israel who's jewish we can smear them and anybody who's pro um israel who's a jewish journalist we can sort of help them out and you know promote their work more and stuff like that mm. so those were the only real two things they were known for um before the project for the new american century and once they founded it i mean their influence over the D.C., Washington, D.C. foreign policy culture was enormous. Um, it, it kind of exploded and then rippled out from there. And we're still, I mean, even now, we're, we're very much still experiencing the ripple effects. And they're not really even dying down um, at all. They're, they're still, the shock waves from that, uh, the inception of the project when the American century are still going. And, of course, um, the eerie prescience of, you know, saying that we need a new Pearl Harbor to accomplish all these goals happened no more than um, a year later um, after they wrote that. They wrote that in the year 2000, I believe in September of 2000. So it was actually almost a, exactly a year later was the 9-11 attacks, which, of course, was the their new Pearl Harbor. Absolutely. And I, I think, again, people will be um, fairly familiar with PNAC and uh, the, the you know the, the concept of a, a quote new Pearl Harbor and uh, you know how intimately they were involved but but what I really you know what I actually really got out of the movie <clears throat> was uh, you know the people in PNAC that you don't really hear about but are actually much more influential and Robert Kagan would be you know first and foremost I knew of him um, because uh, at, you know he was recently working uh, for uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, yes. uh, in her in her State Department, um, so I knew of him, and then of course, I mean, we'll, we'll get into uh, his familial connections, which are even more interesting, uh, maybe. But uh, he, you know, he he is one of these people that we don't hear a lot about, but that really has a lot more influence. And again, Wolfowitz and you know even Bill Crystal, these are big name people. People understand who they are. Uh, it's very easy to you know put a, a you know a, a name to a face with them, but it's people like Robert Kagan who are a little bit more behind the scenes uh, that are really uh, you know crafting creating 
the, the sort of ideological and like the political arm of the U.S. deep state. And that's, that's sort of how I saw, uh, you know, that's how I viewed a lot of the stuff in your film through that lens, that this is really the political intellectual arm. And you can listen to Robert Kagan. He is smart. He is an intellectual. Uh, when he's discussing things, um, you know, whereas a lot of, you know, Bill Crystal, I guess, is, but speaks very much in, in sound bites and stuff like that. Uh, and just a quick note, uh, you're talking about the U.S. Information Agency, uh, that existed from 53 to 1999, and they were uh, oh, instrumental wow. in, uh, I mean, that's like Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which I'm sure we'll get to a little bit later on. Uh, and they were eventually folded into the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which uh, I'm sure my listeners will be a little bit familiar with because the uh, BBG is a big funder of uh, Tor and the tor- the whole Tor project and yep. that whole you know <laughs> that whole thing. We we won't get uh, too into that right now. Uh, but just want to throw that out that again, this is a that's a very influential uh, organization in and of itself, and that Robert Kagan is working there is certainly a, a big. Um, you know that's a that's a big warning sign, but um, but Robbie, I don't know. Why don't we why don't we kind of get into a little bit about that? This sort of uh, this sort of like the intellectual side of this, because you know I think that people, uh, you know, they understand. Okay, yeah, PNAC, they wrote this this whole paper, uh, you know, calling essentially for nine eleven. You know, there's a bunch of other you know famous phrases. You talk about you know Tom Donnelly coining the phrase a new Pearl Harbor. Um, allegedly, yeah. Allegedly, yes, yeah. Uh, He's, no, he takes the, credit for it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. Anytime yeah. someone asks him about it, <laughs> but um, you know, let let's kind of get into a little bit, you know, beyond that because I think it's easy. Sometimes people dismiss PNAC, uh, either as just this thing that sort of existed just for a very short time. Uh, you know, to kind of get everyone riled up and then, oh, we have 9-11, it's not a big deal. Or they view PNAC as, you know, uh, some, some sort of, you know, Zionist plot or something like that. Uh, and we can get into, we can debate that later if you want to. But what I find interesting uh, in your film is that you, you're really sort of diving into this as a much larger picture. That PNAC is, is a, it's a, there's, there's a broader and a very heavy agenda um, behind what PNAC is doing, and that's still going on right now. So, if you want to comment a little bit on that, on the sort of the the larger picture, and how this is, you know, very much um, about the sort of perpetual warfare state, which I think, uh, sadly, the alternative media has kind of dropped the ball on that lately. Um, they've sort of, you know, they, they sh- they've shifted to other things, but that's still very much a part of what's going on here. So, I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, as you said, yeah, the, the alternative media has, I think they've done a terrible job in covering um, any anything really for the last four or five years in terms of military interventions or, or you know, suspicious moves in, in different countries, governments being, you know, toppled like in Ukraine. Um, I, th- I think Syria and Ukraine really... Um, I don't know exactly what it was about those events, but I really do think they broke. It was sort of like almost like the straw that broke the camel's mm. back. Like people, people's intellectual capacity was hurt um, <laughs> as a result of that. And I don't know if it's because we, because because Russia is now inserted into the equation where it's now we have another global superpower we can project our hatred onto. You know, in a, a similar way that we were able to with Saddam, but now it's like. You know, this guy is not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to be here for a while. Let's hate him and hate, you know, his country's human rights instead of, you know, talking about the perpetual war and police state going on here in this country. So I think that hurt people's just intellectual capacity to really. I, and I, I mean, my preference is to look internally at our own country's problems because we have a shitload of them. <laughs> and, you know, especially post 9-11, most of those problems that were amplified and and you know put in place after 9-11 have not been rolled back i mean 90 percent of them you know have not been rolled Mm. back and in some instances there's new ones and even worse ones i mean so the bigger picture with pnac always seemed to be about them reacting um to the collapse of the soviet union Mm. and by reacting I, i just mean that they if you've seen um you know i have a I, I, I enjoy some of uh, Adam Curtis's films. And in a lot of ways, uh, people might compare my 
uh, my documentary, a very heavy agenda to what power of nightmares was sort of laying out. Um, mm. you know, maybe just in a thematic sense that it's sort of like the origins of the neoconservatives and, and what effect they had on the Bush administration. That's more, <clears throat> um, power of nightmares. Yes. My movie, as you said, is more about what, you know, who were the exact specific people who drove the ideas and were the most influential with these ideas that influenced the Bush administration, and not just the Bush administration, but the Obama administration, mm. and probably every future administration <laughs> um, for the rest of our lives, and unfortunately. Uh, but that, um, that reaction to the collapse of the Soviet Union was basically them um, looking forward in time, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. They think in game theory um, ways. So they're, they're looking at, you know, strategically, where is the United States going to be in 40 years, um, or 30 years? And where's Russia going to be, you know, is, is after the collapse of the Soviet Union? Um, can we trust the idea that Russia will remain a, um, a benevolent nation and won't, um, want to posture itself, you know, 20 years down the road? Can we, can we, um, expect that Russia will stay like that? Or is there a possibility that Russia will become aggressive again and will sort of challenge us again? And and the way that they think game theory, I mean, I'm sure you're probably familiar with it, is they assume the worst case scenario that, well, in 20 years, let's just assume, you know, or 10 years, let's assume that Russia will become more aggressive and posture itself more aggressively and try to be more independent and fight against NATO. So what do we do then if that happens? And in a weird, twisted way, that's pretty much what PNAC's Rebuilding America's Defenses is all about. It's sort of about this vacuum of instability that they see that was created after the collapse of the Soviet Union has created this void of either opportunity or chaos um, to come in and make all these new movements to sort of lock down American hegemony, essentially. Lock it down in a way that they weren't able to do before. Because the Soviet Union created this counterweight of, you know, as Robert Kagan refers to it, the bipolar world. Um, so without that, it's either, you know, go balls to the wall <laughs> and, and really, you know, move this machinery even faster and stronger. Or sort of maybe try to create a situation where we're, you know, in a bipolar world again. And I don't know. It's hard for me to decide which outcome they really preferred. I mean, because... At, at, on one hand, um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to really see the, the end goal of where it's going, but it's definitely, I see it now that we're in a place much more preferable to these neocons who created Project for the New American Century than we were even during the Bush administration. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what you said at the very end of your, your last uh, question was um, that you know, the alternative press has done a disservice to the uh, sort of this anti, you know, police state endless war mindset um, or covering that. Um, I think that's exactly what the neocons wanted all along. They mm. basically wanted to normalize um, these beliefs. And they and and what's scary to me is they have succeeded in doing that um, because you'll see now very liberal people who I think you know, I look at as being anti-war people talking about implementing no-fly zones in Syria or doing these things, um, you know, sending weapons to Ukraine. And so I think that we've reached a point now where it is hard to distinguish between neo what we once understood as neoconservative thought and what's now just normal sort of American policymaking. No, I think, I think you really hit the, the nail on the head right there with this sort of normalizing war. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I'm at the point, I mean, there is no anti-war movement anymore. You know, you'll see, I'm sure Correct. you've seen this, Robbie, you'll see, you know, people on Twitter, you know, in the description, of, oh, they're anti-war this, they're, they're against the neocons, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, they, you know, they love Putin, they love Assad. And I understand that they're, you know, Assad may be a little bit different in that he is sort of, an, you know, the last independent leader in that region, but you don't have to love Assad, you know, to, because you hate NATO. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's very much what the neocons 
a work, you know, could be, you know, uh, pushing for it, it, you know, it, it, there is none of this, like, no, they're all bad. You know, we should stop war. It's this sort of, uh, no, but you know, we, we have to support one of these guys. So let, let's go with this one, you know? Oh, okay. I guess we're all going to, you know, love, uh, we're all going to love Assad or, or Putin. That's still feeding into the perpetual warfare state. Uh, and Absolutely. It's, you know, really, uh, that really did, you know, that, that's come across to me more so lately because it's, I mean, you, you don't you see these these quote anti-war people, uh, but they you know they fully support warlike acts as long as it's the right person doing it against you know the the evil American empire, which it, it certainly is. But um, it's just a kind of pathetic, uh, you know, uh, you know, just I guess make up your mind, just admit that you you're fine with this as long as it's the other guy doing it. Um, and I think that is also in a way you know that's sort of what. Uh, the, you know, the neocons kind of liked that about, you know, when the Soviet Union did exist, that there was this sort of enemy. Uh, and they've certainly resurrected this this uh, notion lately. Um, and, and again, that's another interesting thing that your, your, your movie really picks up on is that this isn't about really about the Middle East. This isn't, you know, there's a lot of, oh, PNAC was, you know, this was just about, uh, you know, the I don't know, uh, propping up Israel. Uh, it was just, you know, an excuse to get into all these, you know, Iraq and the oil and stuff like that. This really is all about Russia and to a lesser extent, China. Uh, and that's Absolutely. always what Islamic extremism, um, you know, at least the sort of CIA or, or Gladio B type uh, extremism has always been about. Uh, and, you know, that's why, you know, Graham Fuller, who I'm sure my my listeners will be familiar with, the CIA agent, uh, you know, he said, you know, at the, at the I believe it was in the beginning of the 90s that, you know, the best way to destroy Russia and China is with radical Islam. You know, it's never been about the Middle East. It's never been about oil. It's always been about Russia. Uh, and again, I mean, people are suddenly caring again, about the, you know, Syrians, and that's only because there's Russian troops there. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we're, we're back there again, you know, and now suddenly, oh, everyone, you know, all the, the neocons and the, the liberal intervention, oh, we, we got to, yeah, Assad, Assad is horrible, we've got to, you know, carpet bomb the whole place. Um, and it's only because, you know, Ukraine has sort of settled out, and now <gasps> there's Russian troops, uh, you know, on, on the, in the east of Syria. But, um uh, Robbie, why don't we why don't we kind of um, it, it flesh out uh, the the Kagan family a little bit because they again they feature prominently in the first part of this and uh, I believe they're going to be featured throughout uh, in parts two and three. But as we said, I mean Robert Robert Kagan is uh, you know founder of PNAC. He also worked at the Brookings Institute, State Department for Reagan and for Hillary Clinton. Um, but he's married to a very interesting uh, person. Uh, and that's Victoria Newland. So, um, you know, and, you know, she's a, a former NATO ambassador. She's State Department now for Obama. Uh, chief, she was chief of staff to um, Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot, who uh, recently uh, just made a, quote, prediction that there would be a third Chechen war. Of course, that's, you know, aimed at Russia. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also, really importantly, too, we've got his brother, Frederick Kagan, who's, who taught at West Point. He's now at American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he was one of the you know these big architects for the surge. He's very close with Petraeus and McChrystal. And uh, but his wife is maybe even more interesting, and that's Kimberly Kagan. And she um, uh, is the founder of the Institute for the Study of War, which is the most transparent uh, you know quote nonprofit. Uh, in the world. It's basically funded, uh, you know, according to their own website, by Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, DynCorp, General Dynamics, and Palantir, Peter Thiel's um, wow. company. Yeah. I, didn't, I knew the other ones, but I didn't know Palantir. That's very yes, interesting. Yes, I, I was just checking the other That's day. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I know. No, no. As the second I saw Palantir, I was wow. like, oh, dear God, this is bad. <laughs> wow. But, um, uh, Robbie, yeah, kind of. It, it, let's talk about uh, the, the Kagan family and 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 some of the you know familial things because again, this is like they're they're one of the, these these groups of people that we just don't hear a lot about, um, but they really are everywhere. I mean, I, I mean, and I, I know we we were sort of talking um, you know offline a couple of days ago about you know Robert Kagan and Victoria Newland, and I don't know. I mean, maybe we, you know we're probably going to be speculating a bit here, but I mean, what do you think is going on there? I mean, that is a real power couple. Absolutely. I mean, so people you know who've seen House of Cards. Um, I, it, it's it's 
it's like the you know it's like uh, Frank Underwood and his wife Claire are represented in that show, but in some ways far far more powerful and far scarier. I would say you know minus the pushing people into moving trains and stuff mm-hmm. like that parts of House of Cards, but just in a general sense, um, very similar. Um, but I just wanted to um, mention uh, really quickly that. Um, Oh man, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I was going to it's kind of stupid, but so I guess think of the think of the Kagan family or specifically Robert Kagan in the same way that you would like you know how you you you'll hear about like um you know really influential sort of maestro like musicians um who were these really strong influences on all these other musicians who are really who who later became really famous. Mm. But you you don't hear very much about like that person who influenced all these people, they're sort of more in the background or they never really achieved fame. You know, same, similar with stand-up comedy. There'll be like these comedians yeah. who are highly influential who'll somehow remain under the radar for their whole career, but like the people in the comedy scene will like know about this person. They'll all be aware of them. They're very well respected, but just for some reason they're not famous. Mm. And I see it's like it's a very similar way to the way the Kagans have navigated through D.C., is their ideas, the entire family, um, all of them, uh, their ideas are highly influential. They are well known among probably every journalist in D.C., every policy wonk, every academic out there. But yet, as you said, they're not known outside of that, really. Um, you know, I've heard the name Robert Kagan for years, but I never even saw him talking, you know, yeah, until yeah, I didn't know a year looked. and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, how is that possible? You know that these people who have had such a strong influence have um, have remained off the radar for so long. And I, the only explanation I have is that it's deliberate. They're not interested in becoming famous uh, pundits uh, or even you know like Bill Crystal, where they're famous as editorialists or mm-hmm. people appearing on television. They only care about uh, being well known in this small bubble of foreign policy strategists in Washington D.C. And in that bubble, um, they are probably the most powerful, influential people uh, by far um, I, I'm, I'm tr- in terms of ideas uh, and strategy and thinking. Um, you know, obviously, all the money, as you said, comes from, uh, you know, defense contractors. It's not even it's not even hidden. And that's also what's fascinating about all this is that, you know, it, it, coming from sort of the more you know i've i've dipped my foot back and forth into the conspiracy world you know uh, more than my fair share and uh there's a sort of i think there's a there is a i don't want to say fallacious belief but there's a i think there's a there's a, a skewed belief that there is sort of this hidden hand that that's guiding everything at all times but what's so fascinating when you watch the kagans talk is they're talking very openly about all this stuff that we know is terrible and we we'd like to think is all being maybe orchestrated behind the scenes but they're all laying it out on the table in public mm. it's and i think that's something that people haven't looked at closely enough is that is that part of this is to sell the idea of this sort of endless war conspiracy if you'll call it but not in a hidden way they want to normalize it to the point where they want it uh, transparent. They want people. Um, something about it is they want people to 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 know these things and to be influenced by them. So that's that's also weird to me. Is that um, you know there's uh, there's definitely a different approach here than you know maybe the the sort of deep state of old uh, where you know they would do everything um, sort of at a at a you know in a very secretive way. And I, I would argue this is maybe a slightly newer, refined approach where for some reason selling things like this to the public and to these policy wonks in, um, you know, in public uh, is somehow has some sort of you know, uh, benefit to, um, to them to do that. Mm. But, but yeah, the Kagan family, I'll just go over them really quickly uh, because you know, you, you'll, I don't want to spoil too many things about – about just how crazy they are, but um, <laughs> but Victoria Newland specifically is probably the the one who seems to be the most neutral on the surface. She's she uh, has gone through Democratic uh, Republican administrations. Yes. Strobe Talbot uh, 
interestingly enough, is a Democrat. And he, uh, he, I've heard him described as a cold warrior Democrat. And apparently, after the Berlin Wall fell, he came up with this idea that if Europe uh, wasn't, quote, whole free and at peace, unquote, that um, we really haven't won the Cold War. Um, that if any of these, you know, former Warsaw Pact nations or nations that were under Russia's thumb, if any of them are still on the fence or still, you know, leaning towards Russia, that means that our work is not finished in terms of the Cold War. Um, so, inarguably, I mean, some of this thought that led to the Ukraine situation now comes from not even really neocons. It also comes from these sort of, you know, holdovers from the, the Cold War, the, you know, Democrats like Strobe Talbot. Mm. And throughout part two of, of A Very Heavy Agenda, I basically found, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 instances of different policymakers and different actual Obama administration officials using uh, Strobe's, uh, Talbot's phrase that he coined, uh, that it, we, we needed a Europe whole free and at peace. And I just didn't realize, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, it's not a talking point that's being pushed to you and me mm. or the general public. Like Fox News isn't talking about a Europe whole <laughs> free and at peace, right? But for some reason, this is a talking point that's been parroted and fully understood by the policy wonks and the academics in this small bubble. And it's, it's become this running theme. And I think just that phrase alone sort of explains uh, in a large way why things are the way they are now with Ukraine and Russia. Mm. Um, is that to a lot of these people, the Cold War really never ended, um, even with the collapse of, of the Soviet <laughs> Union. So that's, that's, that's the Victorian Newland side of things. And of course, she was caught on a leaked phone call um, trying to play musical chairs with the Ukrainian opposition before the, you know, uh, just like meddling with the, who, you know, who was going to get into the Ukrainian government and, and that kind of thing as the government was collapsing. Um, and of course, the U.S. government said Russia leaked that phone call. Um, who knows if that's actually true? Uh, mm. But, you know, that's that's that side of it. And Robert Kagan plays the the. Uh, government outsider. He is mostly an intellectual. He's a writer. Uh, he's written several best-selling books, one of which was called The World America Made, which I find particularly fascinating because it's basically an attempt to rewrite American history. Um, and if we're talking about normalizing neoconservatism, he went as far as you could go with that concept <laughs> and basically has rewritten the entirety of American history to seem neoconservative in retrospect, mm. to make it seem like everything we've done throughout our entire history has been in line with what is described now as neoconservative foreign policy. Um, and that book uh, was uh, one of the like four books that Obama was reading um, when he got into office, right. along with a team of rivals, that, that book about the, you know, Lincoln's presidency. So, you know, and, and if you think that's as far as it went, that Obama was just sort of reading this, influential neoconservative book um he also uh ended up uh taking in um robert kagan uh via hillary clinton as you mentioned earlier uh, when she was working as secretary of state she appointed him to a really similar role that richard pearl was appointed to in the bush administration mm. um he i think he was working under the pentagon and and uh, robert kagan was basically working at the state department but keep in mind that the state department was a lot more activated after this sort of NATO um, amplification and, and the Ukraine situation. State Department played a much less significant role before that really happened. Um, and I think it's very easy to see that when you sort of go back now. I mean, you know, I didn't even know, you know, what's her name, Jen Psaki or the, yeah. uh, the, other, the other State Department spokesperson. I mean, you didn't even see the, those people really before or the people who were before them, like, talking. And now we see them all the time. And I think that's, you know, that's just evidence that this State Department role has dramatically increased now that we're sort of heading at least, you know, down towards the road of, of uh, some kind of military confrontation with Russia. And I, I hesitate to use the word, you know, the phrase new Cold War because it's not at all like the Cold War, but... It is only in the way that we are, you know, it, it basically we can't allow Russia to be independent and aggressive 
and posture themselves the way they are now. It's just we can't allow it. And that's the way that uh, we're looking at that. Um, and I don't know if Obama is actually – it's hard to tell where Obama is on this um, it, also. So like I, it's hard for me to say if Obama is all is fully on board with this or if at a certain point he – you know, he he got alarmed by the, the direction it was going and decided to start dragging his feet a bit. Um, I think at best, the best case scenario is that the only thing Obama did was put up a tiny bit of passive resistance, maybe, um, in the situation in, in Syria and, and in Ukraine. But ultimately, it's, things are still going in a horrible direction in both countries. So, you know, whatever foot dragging I, I might have imagined he put up is not really having much of an effect. And then, yeah, the Institute for Study of War um, is is interesting because you'll you'll basically see almost all of the technical data about ISIS coming out comes from the Institute for Study of yeah, War. Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll see maps in the New York Times. Pretty much every map or diagram or stat you see about ISIS or what's happening in Iraq or Syria, you'll you'll see a little thing at the bottom of the article hmm. saying source hmm. of this this statistic comes from this report from the Institute of Study of War. So the influence is wide reaching, but it's not like you'll see Kimberly Kagan's face in the New York Times. She doesn't want to be uh, famous. Mm. And I think that's kind of the point. Um, it's more the ideas are more important here. Mm. No, and, and just uh, going back to, to something you were saying before about um, how open they are. And that's something that really comes across in some of the clips that you um, that you show in, in part one, uh, especially Robert Kagan. Um, you know, first of all, he openly confesses his love of like militarism and war. You know, he says that this is this is how America has always been. We've always been expansionist. Therefore, it's it's always good when we, you know, expand the, the American empire. Uh, and, you know, it's it, funny. You, you were also saying, too, um, you know, they don't really want fame. And that, that's certainly true. But again, the, the sort of, you know, the invisible secret hand that's running all this stuff. But again, Robert Kagan is very open that there's really no difference between presidents yeah. at all. He says this all the time. <laughs> you know, he's like, there's really nothing different between, uh, you know, Bush one, then Clinton, then Bush again, and then yeah. Obama. He's very open that there's really nothing different and that it's all really the same and that we're all, you know, we're all about this one overarching agenda. So it's really interesting. They're not hiding it at all. And that's sometimes that's what's, you know, I find that even more startling uh, that they're normalizing that idea, too, that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you have, it, you know, as president. We ultimately will, you know, it's the same plan. It's the same agenda. And, you know, I'm going to tell this to, you know, a giant, you know, classroom full of people or at a huge, you know, security seminar or something like that. You know, he's yeah. on C-SPAN talking about this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it, you know, it, again, very, very startling. And um, and again, yeah, the, the Institute for the Study of Wars, you know, it, it, that, that's an interesting thing, too. All these statistics and maps about ISIS, um, you know, that that's that's always them. But um Shifting gears a, a little bit, Robbie. Um, there's also been this um, this sort of resurgence of the neoconservative movement, um, and you know it's sort of becoming like it's it's acceptable again to be a neocon. You know, there was that brief period where everyone was like, no, they are evil, and you know, even the sort of man on the street was, uh, you know, if you said neocon, that was like a dirty word or something. People understood that. Um, but I've seen this, I mean, A, it's like Bill Crystal is back. He sort of disappeared. Um, and you know, then it was like he, he decided to join Twitter and he had like a, you know, a million followers in like a, a minute. So, you know, we see Bill Crystal being back, but there's also this like rise of the sort of neocon hipster. Um, and, uh, you know, we have people like Eli Lake, uh, Josh Rogan, uh, ben Smith at uh, BuzzFeed, also Rosie Gray at BuzzFeed, um, yeah. James Kerchick, uh, who we can get into a little bit, and also you know like Vice Magazine, um, which I, I saw in the trailer for part two. You have you have a few you have a bunch of clips, from <laughs> and Vice is at the forefront of a the sort of American you know imperialistic agenda, but also this sort of like hipster neocon thing. And for anyone that doesn't know, Gavin McGinnis who is a co-founder of Vice and is, you know, he's referred to as the godfather of hipsterdom, is an out-and-out neocon. And he even says that's how he would describe himself, as a neocon. And he said that, you know, Vice was all about, you know, 
changing people into this neoconservative viewpoint. And again, that's like all of what Vice does. But um, you want to kind of you know talk about that, and again, also the establishment of the foreign policy initiative, um, which yeah. is also this sort of again part of this resurgence of PNAC, but also of neoconservatism. So I don't know. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, so part two of the movie, and and I. I'm assuming you're talking about the the trailer at the end of yes. part one. I kind of pulled up Back to the Future two move and <laughs> and kind of s- previewed the rest of the the movies at the end of part one. But so part two is called How We Learn to Stop Worrying and Love the New Neocons. <laughs> and who I'm referring to as the new neocons are are these people that you just uh, w- went into um, Eli Lake, Josh Rogan, James Kerchick. Um, but but there's 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 more even than those people. There's there are these um, there's there's these new people I've been sort so at first when I started making the movie, those were the people that were on my radar the most because a lot of them were sort of involved in um, trying to uh, lodge uh, um, you know attacks at Russia today, and they were sort of mm. persistent about it for quite mm. a bit. That's died down actually a lot. Yeah. Um, they're they're not focused on that anymore. Right now they're focused on Syria, of course. Um, but there's, there was a group of other people, um, that you'll see now writing a lot for the daily beast. And, uh, there's a guy actually who had a very influential book, um, named Peter Pomerantsev, uh, who, and I don't know if you have seen Adam Curtis's like newest couple of films, No, Um, but so he did, he did this short film uh, for I think it was for that guy Charlie Booker's The Wipe uh, TV show in, mm. in England, and it was like a 15 minute long short about Putin and about uh, Russia and their and the way they manipulate the public in Russia. Mm. And what was so fascinating about about it is almost all of it was sourced from uh, this guy uh, Peter Pomerantsev's book, um, and the, the Peter Pomerantsev's book is basically uh, this very well written book about how Russia manipulates the media and how Russia's propaganda machine works. And it's like written almost in this like John Ronson kind of clever humorous (laughs) style. Right. But this guy, um, managed to, uh, become so influential, um, you know, not, not even to neocons. I'm, I'm not even just, I, it's hard to call him a neocon, but what he's effectively doing is he is feeding in to this idea that Russia is this enemy. It's, um, it's really scary. It has this really scary propaganda apparatus that somehow is going to upset the world or, or, or America. And um, Adam Curtis totally fell for it. And uh, half of this short is just echoing all of these really, um, in my mind, unbelievable claims that Peter Pomerantsev makes. And uh, so... And what's what's interesting about that, um, and I'll I'll get off this tangent in a second, is that Mark Ames, um, who you may be familiar with, yeah. also uh, was sourced in Adam Curtis's short. So it was kind of almost like a mixture between mm-hmm. Mark Ames and Peter Pomeros of uh, <laughs> research that uh, Curtis was using. But so I asked Mark Ames about it because I was like, you know, that's really weird because I've seen Peter Pomeros of being promoted by all of these neocons, all of them. I mean, they love his work. It's they're like you know, his biggest fans mm. as, as these, the hardcore neocons. And he, um, he was all baffled by it too. Cause he had read Peter Pomerantsev's book. He thought it was really interesting. He thought some, a lot of it was true because of his own experience in Russia. But yet, you know, he, he thinks that Peter Pomerantsev might be actually, you know, out there playing some kind of larger strategy and, and, and is willingly shilling for these neocons and some sort of really clever, way um but you know there's other people like michael weiss um who write for daily beast now they used to be uh part of the same think tanks that peter pomerasov talks at the atlantic council yeah. institute for modern russia so these are these more eurasianist think tanks that aren't traditionally referred to as neoconservative but yet they're perfectly in line with this sort of long-term neoconservative goal of reigniting um a cold war like scenario or posture towards Russia. But, you know, the foreign policy initiative um, is is basically the newest uh, 
or it is the new iteration of the project for the new American century. Uh, the project for the new American century closed down sometime in the late, uh, the end of the Bush, uh, presidency. Um, but it didn't, you know, it wasn't like they were just going to stop working or, or go out of the public eye. They just, uh, essentially reopened a new think tank, <laughs> slapped a new name on it. But this time what was different about this think tank is they had learned from their previous mistakes. <clears throat> they had, you know, this is post Fahrenheit nine eleven era we're talking. So you almost like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of that movie, but it's, you know, you can't deny that Fahrenheit 9-11 and sort of the push public pushback and sort of the mainstream media's acceptance eventually that the Bush administration was really bad. Um, a lot of that made uh, made it so a lot of these neocons had to kind of hide out for a while and, you know, um, think of new ways to sell their ideas because the old ways weren't going to work anymore. And, and someone like Bill Kristol, he in my mind is sort of tainted forever because he, yeah. you know, he was in a big way part <laughs> of that, uh, you know, Fahrenheit nine eleven sort of era where he was on Fox news all the time. Um, really trying to sell these wars. Robert Kagan managed not to, uh, you know, be as exposed. So, but basically the foreign policy initiative, um, they learned from this era. They learned that the public knew that neocons were evil. Um, so, I think that what they did was really smart is they took this new approach where they made their rhetoric softer. Um, they didn't talk uh, like people like Michael Ledeen or like um, people like Bill Kristol used to. They kind of talk more like um, Robert Kagan now. Uh, they, they, have, uh, they have a more clever way of, of, of selling these ideas. And the key, I think, was they, they call it a bipartisan organization. So they're not even trying to present themselves as like a Republican, you know, hawkish wing of the Republican Party or anything like that. They're actually trying to influence the Democratic Party, too. And uh, they've really, really succeeded in doing that. Um, you know, pe for people who haven't been paying attention, we're already past the second House vote for sending offensive uh, weapons to Ukraine. Um, and it passed overwhelmingly. Uh, the second time, I think, was something like 300 to, you know, 300 yes votes to 29 no votes or something like that. That's yeah. that's really scary, you know, to think mm -hmm. that's that is a bipartisan consensus. Um, and in part three of a very heavy agenda, I, I sort of show how every single Democratic uh, congressperson who's out on the floor arguing for this bill appeared at one time or another at a foreign policy initiative uh, talk. <laughs> so. You know, it doesn't take very many people to push these agendas, and that's also another frightening part of it. And they're all doing it in the open too. I mean, it just takes you know maybe five or six Congress people who are sort of advocating for this point of view to normalize the idea on the House floor, and it and and at the same time there isn't very much public pushback at all, or even alternative media pushback against what's going on in Ukraine. Mm. Um, so. That's also another problem. Um, with with the original Syria push, I think that was the last, almost kind of like the last gasp of the and what was left of the anti-war movement. And then after that, um, I mean, as far as I can see, it we're 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 screwed right now with, uh, you know, with sort of, you know, like shaking these people and saying, "Don't you understand? These are <laughs> neoconservative ideas. You're you know, you're going out there and doing." They wouldn't even understand that at that point because to them it, right now it's become normal thought. That's the way that people think in D.C. right now. Mm. Um, and that, that's kind of what we're up against. Mm. It's kind of like how 9-11 uh, debunkers now acknowledge you know, all of the, the main sort of criticisms about 9-11. Like, I mean, that newest uh, Jonathan Kay you know, is going around talking about how we really need to release the 28 pages. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like they're almost like absorbing, they're, they're, they're adapting. Mark Ames mm -hmm. described it that way, that they're actually adapting to the pushback against them. And they're adapting really uh, well, I think. Mm. Very Borg-like. Definitely, no, no, definitely, definitely. That's a, that's a great uh, <laughs> way to describe it. Especially with the, the sort of like hipster neocons. Um, oh yeah, I didn't know, even go into Vice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the whole Vice thing. I mean, they wouldn't even, 
you know, I don't even think they are even aware of the term neocon. Um, and I, I can only assume that a lot of them don't even really get it. But, uh, you know, they're they're reporting on any geopolitical topic, be it Ukraine, Syria, uh, anything. It's uh, Libya, especially. It was always in support of the, you know, of NATO and the neocon agenda. Um you know, and that's that's the best way to sort of, uh, you know, indoctrinate people, you know, oh, no, we're, we're cool and hip and, you know, let's, let's, you know, do coke at parties in Williamsburg and, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, and then when, uh, you know, we're, you, you know, we're at war in Syria. Oh, yeah, that's OK. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. You know, just go back to the do's and don'ts section uh, of Vice and, you know, just forget it. Um, and again, too, people like Eli Lake. Um, Ben Smith at BuzzFeed, again, pushes this in a very soft way where you wouldn't even know it. And again, I, I, uh, the, the scary thing, too, is that, I mean, it's just uh, foreign policy initiative is just PNAC 2.0. And they're just exactly. all back again. And I, I would definitely encourage the listeners to keep an eye on that. And, you know, because God only knows what kind of big paper they're going to come out with, you know, um, just just in time. Uh, for you know this upcoming presidential election, and I can only assume that you know they are positioning themselves again. They're becoming more influential. You know, you, you're going to start. I've even noticed just a marked uh, presence that they've had um, yep. again with, with James Kerchick. I mean, they organized that entire Liz Wall RT uh, resignation. Uh, yeah. you know, completely orchestrated by them. Uh, but yeah, again, we're you're going to start seeing these people pop up more and more, uh, especially, I think, with, you know, in terms of um, the, this presidential election. So, and again, that, that's the thing to, to keep in mind is that these, they never really went away. They were always there. And now they're coming back again in a, 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 a you know, a slightly more covert way. But it's all the same things, as you're saying, too. I mean, you, you've got it to the point now where you've got people espousing these, like, crazy, psychotic policies but they're uh you know they're 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 not they're not neocons you know they're oh no no we're i'm on this i'm on that it's bipartisan um and again obviously you know i don't think neocons really have any political ideology outside of this psychotic desire to rule over everybody um <laughs> yeah but it's um, machiavellianism i mean it yeah. really is uh, you know i when i first started hearing that I uh, know when I was looking at this stuff a long time ago, when people would say, "Oh, it's all you know Machiavelli's philosophies," I kind of wrote it off because it just seemed like an overly simplified way of looking at it. But it, I mean, it really is true. It's um, Robert it, Kagan quotes from Machia- Machiavelli absolutely. constantly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, he's and, open about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and the general idea be the you know behind the, the Machiavellian philosophies they're 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 using is that the public is too stupid mm. to be let in on the truth that the le- the ruler should lie to the public because it's in the public's best interest mm. that's i mean that's a, if you boil it down that's kind of what the the logic they're basing a lot of this stuff on and that's mm. you know that's not that surprising i mean it really <laughs> isn't <laughs> yeah. so uh uh but but back to the idea that um that they don't even call themselves neocon anymore um, you're right about that. They that word uh, does carry uh, a taboo to it. Obviously, it's not uh, it's mm-hmm. not something that people want to be called. Um, most people understand that means um, you know bad things now. But uh, there's a guy that I didn't really even end up putting in the movie. Um, there's been other movies that have covered a lot of him. Uh, Richard Pearl, mm. um, who was very instrumental in in a lot of this stuff in the '90s, also. Um, in 2009, he did something that I thought was pretty ballsy, but also just kind of insane and, and like pretty much a crazy, uh, something a crazy person would do. <laughs> um, he, in February 19th, 2009, he actually held a press conference where he invited all of his harshest critics, um, like pretty much everybody who had written a, like a relatively popular book about neoconservatism and how it was bad. He invited all these people to a press conference to respond to an article he wrote, um, which the article is basically, there is no neoconservative foreign policy. There's no such thing. Um, What people are criticizing in these books are straw men that don't exist because um, 
this is not neoconservative foreign policy. And it's just, it's, it's this ins- uh, very interesting, you know, two hour long press conference where he's just not, you know, breaking a sweat. He's not really flinching. He's just really confidently and, and casually telling these people that they're all wrong, that, um, you know, p- poking holes in all of their arguments in these really kind of mostly just technical, um, semantic mm. ways, you know, I mean, what he's saying is obviously bullshit. I mean, there <laughs> obviously is a neoconservative foreign policy, but he's just sitting there like, just kind of almost like, I, I, I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, you, you'd almost just have to watch it for yourself. But I think that what he was trying to do, maybe this is the beta form of that, but he was trying to do is, was sort of clear the, the slate, you know, the playing field and, and say, there was no neoconservative po- foreign policy. What are you guys talking about? You know, yeah. that's, that's totally inaccurate. You know, mm. we're doing something else here and, and, you know, it's actually pretty normal. It's not that much of a divergent from what you're used to. It's not really what you guys are calling neoconservative. So I think that was the, that was kind of the genesis of that rebranding campaign. And, mm. uh, and the foreign policy initiative is, is, uh, directly coming from that same mentality that, uh, you'll never see anything of, of, na- of theirs, um, that seems blatantly neoconservative. It's always you have to read a little bit, you know. You you have to like spend a little time with it and kind of, you know, look at a few of their articles. It's not as blatant as PNAC. I mean, it's it's not even close. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, again, that's why they they hired James Kerchick, James Kerchick to you know talk about gay rights and and you know oh how you know all, you know only Russia oppresses uh, gay people. Um, but uh, yeah. but um you know I guess I guess uh, maybe we'll we'll start wrapping it up here, Robbie. But um. Let uh, please let everybody know uh, where they can go to watch um, a very heavy agenda part one, a catalyzing event. And I know you're also selling DVDs. And let everybody know uh, where they can go to 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 buy a copy to watch this because I really would suggest it because this is again on a topic that I think people have a they have this false sense of what it is. They think that they know. They think that they understand. And and that's not to put anyone down because I mean myself included. I really didn't know very much about Robert Kagan or even really the foreign policy initiative uh, until I was watching your film. But let everybody know where they can go um, to uh, to watch the film, to buy a copy. Well, so right now um, we're, we're taking pre-orders for, for DVDs. Uh, it's going to come out um, on October 15th. So part one is going to come out on that date. Um, and you can get them at a very heavy agenda dot blogspot dot com and uh we're working right now on trying to get some kind of streaming um like pay a dollar and mm. be able to watch it for like 24 hours uh or 48 hours kind of a streaming service so we haven't quite figured that out yet but uh we're getting there and then um part two and three are going to be out uh um in november so um you know kind of right during the the peak of the primary season yeah. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, um, and, uh, there, there will be some more screenings, uh, out here in the San Francisco Bay area of a very heavy agenda, part one, two and three. Um, and those will probably happen, uh, in October and November. So, uh, if you could, I mean, the very heavy agenda dot blogspot dot com is my blog. So I'll post all updates and details about any future screenings there, uh, that people can find out about. Excellent, excellent, and uh, you know I'll try and keep everyone posted up on my site as well. And uh, I'd love to have you back on when uh, part two and three come out because um, I'm I'm really excited about what uh, what you're gonna say in that. And you're also gonna get into the the uh, the Kagan uh, patriarch uh, Donald Kagan, the father. Um, oh yeah, who uh, you know describes himself as a, a you know a neo everything, a neo Marxist, a neo conservative. So <laughs> well, yeah, you know I can't wait. Oh, to that see. was actually Irving Kristol. That's the Bill's, oh okay, Bill's yes, dad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Don Kagan's kind of like the uh, he's like the master historian of the family. He teaches. Um, he's been teaching ancient history at Yale for the past mm. forty years. Uh, yeah. War history mostly. Mm. Mm. So, and Excellent he's a really stuff. really creepy one. Yeah, he definitely he is. Pay to. <laughs> so, uh, Robbie Martin, thank you so much for for joining us on the podcast. And uh, like I said, I'd love to have you back on to uh, talk uh, some more about all of this. So, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Pierce. Um, had a really good time. Excellent. Okay, everyone. So that was my conversation with Robbie Martin. 
Uh, thank you all so much for listening to this episode. And if you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to hear some more of my work, then please go to PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And there, of course, you can find all of my podcasts free for download as well as uh, streaming on YouTube. If you like the work and you want to you know, keep following it, then definitely follow through the RSS feed. You can always follow through email blasts. Uh, always follow me on Twitter at Porkins Policy, And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com forward slash 1138Porkins. So uh, just some quick little uh, uh, notes, some some upcoming stuff. Um, me and Christoph will be back with a new episode of Porkins Great Game. I know we've been uh, on a little bit of a hiatus there. Um, Christoph was just finishing up uh, school stuff, so he took a little bit of a break uh, from writing the new Great Game Roundups. But he has a new one out. Uh, for about, I think it's now about a week old. He's going to have one up again, of course, on Tuesday. And uh, we'll have an episode up probably um, either this uh, coming week or the week after. So definitely look out for that. Also look out for uh, the... Uh, me and Tom will be doing uh, a Homeland uh, podcast, uh, like a little mini-series. Um, we're, we're trying to do it... Um, you know, once every week when the uh, episodes come out, and we'll probably either take turns, you know, going uh, on clandestine time or going on Porkins Policy Radio. So we're still figuring out that exactly, but um, we're pretty excited about it. This season is going to be, I think, uh, as good, if not better, than the previous season. And uh, we're excited about doing it uh, sort of a week to week uh, show, and that'll that'll be a lot of fun to do as well. Uh, Tom and I are also uh, busy working on the second season of the CIA in Hollywood. Uh, we, you know, haven't forgotten about that. Um, you know, no uh, specific time as to when that's going to be coming out. This is going to be probably a slightly longer season than uh, the first season. We'll have a few more episodes. Um, we already have uh, some really amazing guests lined up. Um, a lot of new guests as well. Uh, people that I think uh, everyone is going to be, you know, get a real kick out of and really enjoy. So we are working on that. Of course, I'm working on, um, you know, some other podcasts for this. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not going to, you know, get into any specifics because, again, every time I do, I, I end up never doing that episode. So <laughs> I won't say that, but I do have some interesting episodes coming up. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have those coming out pretty soon. But again, uh, check out, you know, look out for uh, Porkin's Great Game. Uh, look out for this new, uh, the new episodes on uh, Homeland, the TV show, the uh, fifth season. And uh, I will be talking to you very soon. And thank you so much for joining me.